So, can a website be malware? Now, typically, a web page like this is HTML or hypertext markup language, which is different from programs that are typically C, C++. It's a different format, different type of file that is compiled into an executable that is used in malware attacks. But especially on Windows, that does not mean that an HTML cannot be used as malware with Windows components like MSHTA, which allows a Windows binary to execute HTML code. Now, this technique is used quite often by attackers, like in this case, using booking.com emails and asking people to copy and paste a command which includes malicious HTML code. So here, if you execute MSHTA followed by the website with the malicious HTML, you are going to get infected with a Luma Stealer or some kind of remote access tool or RAT, which is then going to dump all your passwords to the attacker and they might hack all your accounts online and so on. So it's important to understand what HTML is and how it works because a lot of the times even I have received emails that include a malicious HTML. And I think a lot of people click on the HTML thinking it is going to open a website. And that is true in the browser, but you have to keep in mind the whole scripting element, the use of commands like MSHTA, which turns an HTML into something that can be run on the system. There's also the whole concept of JavaScript, which is another scripting language, which is kind of what you would use if you're to use a dynamic website and make it do things like have a timer, again, code that is running on the system in some way, then that can also be used to deliver malware. And a lot of the times there's going to be some interconnected link of JavaScript, PowerShell, and HTML application that is going to be used as a attack path in order to get into your computer and steal your tokens. In this case, ClickFix uses uh, fake booking.com emails and we can have a look at what the email looks like. So classic, verify your booking.com account click on confirm my identity, it all starts here. But I don't wanna fixate on this one particular attack because the reality is these things keep changing. And what I wanna focus on in this video is the idea that HTML can indeed be used as an attack path or an attack vector to get on your computer. So if you receive any kind of email that includes an HTML application, it might make you think it's a Google Doc, it's some kind of document to view, it might be best not to click on it. And definitely do not run commands on your computer like this. I think a lot of people still don't realize that uh, copying and pasting commands is exactly how applications run, not by double clicking. And so they think, oh, I'm just copying and pasting something. What could go wrong? It depends where you're copying and pasting something too. If you're doing it on PowerShell and the run section, a lot of things could go wrong. Another thing worth noting is, um, again, the detection rate for HTML that is malicious is not very high. So in this case, we've got a few detections. Bitdefender does pick it up, but it's not very well detected. So we've got a lot of well-known products that don't see it. And again, this is why I recommend having behavioral protection because um, with most of the attacks, the attackers figure out how to get around the first layer of defense, how to successfully evade your scan Banner, email clients, antivirus, and then the main payload, which may have more detections, is downloaded later. And if we take a look at the behavior in the sandbox, we actually do have some interesting communications. Network requests to a malicious IP. That's another thing I've been noticing more and more is the use of attacker infrastructure. It makes me think if a firewall is um, an effective tool, especially in preventing people getting hacked these days. Because if you have a network level firewall and it blocks all sorts of fishy connections like this, you could actually greatly enhance the security of your whole home network. Another thing to note is that Windows has a lot of components like MSHTA, various means to execute things. It's not just running an exe file. You've got the ability to load DLLs via run DLL. You've got various PowerShell commands that can be used to download malware without going through the browser. So just because something is a Windows component or a Windows process, don't assume that it cannot be part of an attack. Most attackers today will use Windows binaries as part of their attack chain, and it's not gonna be directly detected by the scanners because it's gonna be a Windows process. So again, if you use something like Process Hacker or SysInternals tools to monitor process as malware analyst, don't just assume because you're seeing a system process that uh, it's safe because the virus total detections is zero. Look at the actual connections being made. And yeah, 
If you get an email from booking.com or any similar website asking you to copy paste commands, definitely don't do that. Share this information with your friends. Maybe we should do a detection test of different file formats to see how it all pans out with Windows Defender. Let me know if that's an interesting idea in the comments below. Now, an interesting approach to cybersecurity is the idea of zero trust or default deny, which is used by the sponsor of this video, ThreatLocker. So for example, if I am to try to execute a ransomware on the system, just quick rename and execute, it is not going to work because ThreatLocker is just going to block it and and then only allow us to request access. And even if we do request access, we have a dedicated response center to deal with it. So now we see the file that we've submitted and we can run it in a test environment to see if it's a legitimate file or ransomware. This is like a full virtual machine or malware analysis environment of sorts. And of course, when we run it, we see the ransomware has encrypted all our files. So definitely not doing this on the real system. Now, adding this layer of defense via default deny is a really useful thing for enterprise to prevent them from running untrusted software. Now, they also have the ability to detect threats based on behavior. So for example, we've got a backup deletion here. This is using VSS admin, can alert you of suspicious behavior, but also contain it. Now we did do an independent test of this where we talked about the ups and the downs of this approach. So if you're interested, do watch that using link in description and check them out. It's a very interesting solution. Show them some love for sponsoring our educational videos like this one. Try it out for yourself and let me know your thoughts in the comments below. How do you like the zero trust and uh, default deny approach? And don't forget to like and share this video if you enjoyed it. This is Leo. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, stay informed, stay secure.